Uh, I wrote a book called Your Inner Fish back in 2008. The book was an adventure and a study about the human body. You know, why do we look the way we do? How did we get this way? Turns out, you know, science for the last over, over century has showed us that deep inside every cell, tissue, organ of our bodies lies over three and a half billion years of the history of life. It was also quite profound because it got you thinking about your hands, for example, and um, the idea that this structure of your, of your limb and your hands, you know, one bone, two bone, lots of bones, is actually very common, not just in us, but in mammals and even going all the way back to fish. I think that, you know, Neil's brilliance lay in, um, in taking evolution, which can seem like a remote academic discipline, and making it relevant to everybody. Then I went to meet Neil Shubin and um, discussed the idea of turning this book into a TV series. I gotta say it struck me as really compelling because their vision was one of, of, of deploying first-rate graphics, deploying a team of first-rate visual storytellers to the book. Who could say no to that? I think one lesson that I took away from the experience of making Your Inner Fish is that it's really possible for filmmakers and scientists uh, to collaborate um, and work closely in order to achieve um, excellence in science communication. What I was quite keen to do was that it was almost like you had translucent skin on all the creatures that we animated and you could actually see the underlying anatomy, the bones underneath, they kind of shone through a little bit. All of these fossils that we brought to life were based on real data, on real bits of fossilized bone that had been discovered. So to win this award is really important because I think this collaboration between Tanglebank and Windfall Films actually really tried hard to achieve that. The National Academy of Sciences in recognizing scientific communication is doing something very important and very profound in today's world. That is that scientific communication is ever important and increasingly important with each passing year. We need a population that is knowledgeable about science, that's not intimidated by science, and yes, even some of them have a passion for that science. One thing you can forget is that science is more than just the facts. It's the stories of discovery. And we humans are a storytelling species. So find your story, because you have one inside of you. And when you bring it out to the outside world, you'll be surprised at how well it can be received. I think that scientists like, like Neil Shubin, who have a gift for communicating, science and who have something important to say about science, you know, this is a very important time for them to step forward and tell their stories. And I think that filmmakers can support that enterprise. So please welcome uh, Neil Shubin from the University of Chicago. Hello, thank you. Um, thank you, Doug, for the introduction. Thank you, Susan, for your help setting this hall up. Uh, thank you, the National Academy of Sciences, for being the venue for, uh, for tonight's talk and the, and the conference that will follow. Thank all of you for showing up uh, to hear about your inner fish. Um, I should probably say, you know, how did I get into this whole inner fish thing uh, to begin with? Because uh, it does seem a little odd initially. Um, it had part, there are many, there's much, many parts of the genesis to this, uh, to this story, but much of it began when I started my job at the University of Chicago. The first year I started at University of Chicago, I was pulled in to teach the anatomy course uh, at, at, in the medical school. And I actually came in as the course director for anatomy. And uh, you know, anatomy is the course where our medical students in the first year you know, see the human body in a cadaver for the first time, memorizing tens of thousands of new names. I mean, it's a daunting experience, I mean, in a lot of levels. Uh, it's daunting because there's a sheer amount of work. It's daunting because the students are, are launching their scientific careers. And it's daunting because of mortality. We're standing over a cadaver. And, and it's, it's stressful at a lot of levels. So to decrease the stress, what I used to do is hang around with the students over the tables and, uh, and talk to them, let them get to know me and I would get to know them. Almost invariably, they'd ask, Dr. Shubin, what kind of doctor are you? You know, are you a heart surgeon? Are you a neurosurgeon? Are you a hand surgeon? None of that. I said, well, no, no, I'm a fish paleontologist. <laughs> and they're like, oh man, I want my money back. <laughs> but it soon became clear that being a paleontologist and not just any paleontologist, a fish paleontologist is a powerful way to teach human anatomy. And the reason for that 
is oftentimes some of the best roadmaps to our own bodies lie in other creatures. Some of the best roadmaps to the complex tangle of nerves in our head lie in sharks and fish. Some of the best roadmaps to our skull structure lie in fish and rep what we call reptiles. And the reason for this is that we have a deep connection to the rest of life on our planet. We share a history. Every gene, every tissue, every cell of our body is related to other creatures on the planet, and it's related through a shared history. And that's the concept of your inner fish. But there's another genesis for this thing, and it began when I was a graduate student, and the professor, I was, I was fishing around, pardon the pun, for a PhD dissertation, and I didn't know what I was going to do. So in the, my second year of graduate school, again, I was kind of stressed myself, because, you know, what am I going to do a dissertation on? That seems like a really big deal. The professor showed this slide, and this is the slide that literally launched my career. It's the fish to tetrapod transition, more or less what we knew about it in, in cartoon form in 1987. You have a Cartoon of a fossil fish, that's a critter on top. That's a critter, a lobe fin fish. Uh, they first appear in the fossil record about 390 million years ago. And on the bottom, you have an early limbed animal, a so-called tetrapod, critters that first appear in the fossil record about 365 or so million years ago. I remember looking at this slide as a student, as a graduate student, thinking, this is a first class scientific problem. How did fish evolve to walk? I mean, think of all the things that have to change from respiration to excretion to locomotion, you name it, it's got to change. And I wanted in on this problem, first class. And literally, I've been working on it for, in one way or the other, whether on DNA or in fossils, uh, for about 30 years. So it's, it's either scary or good. I don't know what it is, but it's, it's definitely a statement about me. So I began as a paleontologist. And the toolkit for paleontology is to find new fossils. And, if you, and so to begin that, I kind of used the tools that paleontologists have used for a century or more to find new fossils. And they're simple. They're simple in principle. They're really tough in execution. If you want to find places in the world that hold great fossils, you look for places in the world that have three things. You look for places in the world that have rocks of the right age to hold the fossils of interest. Right? Remember I told you? Critter on top about 390, on bottom about you know, 365. Here you're looking in the Devonian era, pretty much in the late Devonian era. Okay? And if you're interested in mammals, you go to a different time period. But again, age is critical. You've got to put yourself in that window of time to give you, maximize your odds of success. The next piece, and this is a little harder, is you need the right kinds of rocks to hold fossils. Not every kind of rock holds fossils. Some are superheated. Some are super squeezed. Some don't represent the environments that the fossils might would have been preserved in. And so as a paleontologist, you have to be a geologist. You have to learn the right environments that are likely to hold fossil forms. There's a third criterion that's really important, too, and that is it does me no good if my wonderful rocks of the right age and the right type are buried five miles underground. Those rocks have to be preserved at the surface, right? I mean, we literally need to see the rock and see the bones weathering out. And that's why when you open the pages of National Geographic or see where paleontologists work, you know, where are they typically? They're in a place where there's great exposures, usually deserts. Okay, rocks of the right age, rocks of the right type, rocks that are exposed to the surface. There was a th fourth criterion I didn't know about because I was a young scientist, and that was lack of money. I, um, <laughs> I, had, I started my first, as Doug told you, I started my first academic job in the southeastern portion of the state of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia. And what I, you know, I didn't have the ability to do exotic field work to carry a lot of risk in my life. You know, I'd risk of failure, not a good, you know, when you're young, you kind of want to, you know, something a little more safe. So I dug out a geological map of the state of Pennsylvania, and I'm showing that to you now. I've removed everything that's unimportant, and you can see everything in purple here is Devonian. That is, if you look at a map of Pennsylvania, it's covered with Devonian age rocks. Remember I told you rocks of the right age, late Devonian? Well, here, about three hours from my home in southeastern Pennsylvania, I had rocks more or less of the right age, around 365 million years ago. Now, what I'm gonna tell you in the, the science I'm going to show you for the paleontological end is true teamwork. I mean, I'm standing here talking to you about the work, but remember, there were other senior investigators, Farish Jenkins, the late Farish Jenkins from Harvard University, my good colleague, Ted Deschler uh, from Philadelphia. We were a real team on all these expeditions. We were lucky to have great field teams over many years. I'm going to be showing you in over a series of slides about eight years' worth of work, most of it failure, and these were the teams that really helped, helped make it happen. And finally, not just the teams in the field, the teams in the laboratory as well. Artists, preparators, computer graphics experts. 
I mean, so really, teamwork is what this is all about. So don't forget, it's just not me alone doing all this. So we had rocks of the right age, and we had a great team building. Um, what about rocks of the right type? Well, it turns out Pennsylvania is perfect. Because if you want to think about the environment of Pennsylvania and the Devonian, get Pittsburgh, get Harrisburg, get Philadelphia out of your brain, and think Amazon Delta. This is a cartoon of what Pennsylvania looked like 365 million years ago. You had highlands, highlands to the east, where it's labeled Acadian highlands there. You had an inland sea to the west, the so-called Catskill Sea, kind of where Pittsburgh and Cleveland are today. And then draining from east to west are a series of rivers and streams, much like the Amazon, dumping out into the, into the ocean. Now, if you're a paleontologist interested in the transition from life in water to life on land, this is perfect, these environments. Because you can sample, if you have the exposures, ancient estuaries, ancient streams, ancient rivers, perfect. Problem is, Pennsylvania is not known for its exposures. It's not a desert. So in these early days, in the early 90s, our research program became following the Pennsylvania Department of Transportation around as they built new roads. Because what would PennDOT do? What PennDOT would do is they'd blow up, right? And they'd dynamite stuff. And if we were really lucky, they would dynamite where the Devonian rocks. Perfect. And this is one of our sweet spots. It's called Red Hill, Pennsylvania, because it's a hill and it's red, and it's in Pennsylvania, so it's not a clever name. It's about an hour north of State College, so this is a road that, if you took it south, would lead you to State College. And um, you have a human being, this pointer's not working, but um, there's a human being for scale all the way on the, on the right-hand side of the, of, the, of the image there. But what you see here laid out in this, this road cut, which is about half a mile long, it's all Devonian, and those are the layers or the strata of rocks if you were to look close up at these things, what you would see is an ancient stream or a river in cross-section, like lenticular in shape, with coarse grain um, uh, cobbles in the, in, the, in the center and fine grains on the side. Well, as soon as Ted and I hit this, this is about 1992, we started to find fossils. The first things we found were like teeth the size of railroad spikes, the size of your thumb. Then we started to find the jaws of these critters. And their jaws the length of your arm. Ted here is holding the front end of one of these jaws. It's monster fish. The whole fish was about 16 feet long. Big, carnivorous thing. We started to find lots of armored fish. These are, this is a lobe finned fish, actually. And then one year I was out in the field. Ted went to the site and found, boom, he found a limbed animal, a so-called tetrapod. He found a humerus, an upper arm bone. He found a shoulder. He found leg bones. This place now had early limbed animals. Boom, we found what we were looking for. And we worked with National Geographic over the years to reconstruct what this ancient road cut in Pennsylvania looked like 365 million years ago. And this is it. You had some of the first trees, you can see it on either sides of the stream. You had, this is a, a shallow freshwater stream with that giant monster fish. Remember the one with the teeth the size of railroad spikes? And then we had all kinds of uh, armored animals swimming around. And then you can see them here all through there several different kinds of limbed animals, several different kinds of tetrapods. It was a gold mine. But Ted and I realized we had a problem. We were already finding lots of different kinds of limbed animals. And they were very derived or very advanced. So really, we were in rocks that were too young to answer the question of interest. Look, this is what motivated it, right? If we wanted to find something in the middle, we were in rocks that are about 365 million years old in our Catskill rocks. It became very clear looking at what other people have discovered from around the world, looking at the kind of rocks that are available and the, the evolutionary trees that people generated from that, we had to move back about 10 to 15 million years in time from rocks that were 365 to rocks that are about 375 or 380 to the so-called Franian, F-R-A-S-N-A-N, Franian period of the late Devonian. That's going to mean something to you in a second, hopefully. To give you a sense of what we're looking for, I wanted to find an intermediate, like a flat-headed fish with fins. Get a, look at a sense, look at the fish on top and the limbed animal on the bottom. You see a big change in architecture of the skull, right? The critter on top, you know, like most lobe fin fish, has a conical head with eyes on either side. Early limbed animals have sort of a flattish head with eyes on top. Indeed, the proportions are very much different. The fish on top has a head that's connected to the shoulder by a bunch of bones. The limbed animal on the bottom has a neck where the head can swivel independently of the body. That's a good thing if you're supporting yourself on limbs. And finally, I mean, I could list these differences on and on and on, but limbed animals, tetrapods, have limbs with fingers and toes and wrists and ankles, a very defined structure to the skeleton. And fish have fins, right? Fish, fish have fins with fin rays. 
Well, Ted and I were finding a lot of fingers and toes and wrists and ankles in rocks about 365 million years old. What we needed to do was to go back in time to rocks about 375, 380. So we pulled out the paleontological rule book again, looking for places in the world that are rocks of the right age, rocks of the right type, and rocks that were exposed to the surface. Uh, this is the early days of the internet, so you know we sort of fired up our computers and sort of went to the library. We had an idea to work in Alaska. We had an idea to work in Brazil. Then everything, and this is a true story, everything changed one day in my office in 1998 at Penn. Um, Ted and I had an argument, and to settle the debate, I pulled out my college geology textbook. Okay, some arcane minutia was in there. And then after the you know, argument was over, I'm sort of chewing the fat with Ted, and we're sort of turning the pages of the book, and I find this diagram. It's another diagram that changed my life. This is a diagram that shows exactly what we're looking for, so I'm going to spend a little time on it. It says in its legend, Upper Devonian Sedimentary Facies. These are rocks that are sort of the right class of rocks, right, to produce, formed in, in, in oceans and rivers and streams and so forth, and Upper Devonian, right window of time. What you see is a map of North America, and superimposed on that map of North America is an interpretation of the, of the environments that the rocks reflect, the Devonian rocks reflect. So the western part of the United States, according to this map, had rocks that are marine, marine Devonian. But you could see where I'm going. There are three places marked in red that these textbook authors identified as being ancient delta systems, uh, just much like what Ted and I uh, were already found to be successful. The first one we knew about, right? That's the Catskill. Been there, done that, right? That's what I just showed you. That lent me faith that these guys knew what they were talking about. The second is um, a set of rocks in East Greenland, where a, a, a colleague of mine, Jenny Clack, from Cambridge University, made some astounding discoveries uh, in the late 80s, building on work from uh, Swedish teams uh, in the 20s uh, and 30s. But you can see where I'm going. Extending 1,500 kilometers east to west across the Canadian Arctic were rocks that were unexplored, Devo mapped Devonian from uh, Delta Deltaic system. I looked at Ted. I said, Ted, do you know anybody who's worked on these rocks? He says, no, do you? I said, I just asked you that question. So we went back and forth like that in a while. Like, Nobody's worked on these rocks. Boom. We ran to the library. <laughs> Using the, this geological textbook as a guide, I kid you not. The geological textbook turned us on to the work of this guy, Ashton Embry. Ashton Embry was sent by the Canadian government to map the rocks in this region of the Canadian Arctic. And they'd set them off. This is back in the 70s. This is a picture of Ashton back in, uh, actually in the late 60s, early 70s. Um, they'd set them off with a geological tools, mapping device, an Inuit helper, a sledge, a whole bunch of canned food, and hopefully a can opener, and then they'd leave. And he would be there for like three or four weeks mapping these rocks. That work led to this paper. It's not going to be a movie version, but there's a reason why I'm, there's method to my madness. The title of this paper, which was very important to us, was the Middle Upper Devonian Clastic Wedge of the Franklinian Geosyncline. Now, why am I doing this? Why am I, why am I showing you this crazy paper? People always ask me, how do you know where to look? Well, what I do is I refer them to this page, OK? It has everything I need. When Ashton talked about the age of these rocks in the um, Canadian Arctic, the available data indicated an age of early to middle Franian. What was the age we were looking for based on other finds? Franian. And here we are, bingo, right in the right place. When Ashton talked about the kinds of rocks, he, he called them the Fram Formation. He named, he, named it, he named them that. He said, the Fram Formation is similar to the Catskill Formation in Pennsylvania. <laughs> OK, is there any questions of why I was so excited to go to the Arctic and spend eight years not succeeding, ultimately succeeding? So anyway, so um, Ted and I um, were really excited. We found this paper. This all happened in one morning in my office at Penn. Um, and so we went to get Chinese food uh, in the Chinese restaurant across the street. I had my Kung Pao chicken, and I had a fortune cookie. And I kid you not, that fortune cookie is so important, it has moved with me from, from Philadelphia to Chicago. It blew my mind at the time, and it, I knew I was faded. It said, soon you will be sitting on top of the world. <laughs> <laughs> I, I never played those numbers, by the way, for the lottery. I should have. <laughs> anyway, anyway, so we're a long way away from... Um, uh, from This is where we're at, right? So we're up here. Um, I can't drive my station wagon up there, sorry. No road cuts. Um, this is pretty far away. It's daylight 24 hours a day in the summer. Uh, dark 24 hours a day in the winter. Um, polar bears are up there. Polar bears eat people, so we've got to be careful. We don't want to be eaten. Um, everything has to be flown in. To give you a sense of what this is like, the nearest town to our, what became our fossil sites um, is about 250 miles away. 
It has a, it's a town of 170 Inuit who live there year round. This is a picture of that town, Greece Fjord, Canada. This is a picture of that town in spring. Okay, so that's a big city. So what that means is we're very, very dependent, as most Arctic research is, on aircraft, both fixed wing and rotary. Um, that's a twin otter, the airplane there, they can land on the tundra. They have a stall speed of 55 miles an hour. When you take off in a headwind, it's like a vertical takeoff and landing device, it's kind of freaky. Um, but we're beyond the tank of gas of a helicopter. So the, the twins have to come in with the, with the fuel and it's a whole logistic thing where we have to leapfrog the helicopters out. Anyway, from Ashen's paper, I colorized one of the diagrams. Um, you have a map of the Arctic and what she, basically the take home message of this map is everything that's surrounded by red there are Devonian age rocks. So we had an enormous amount of Devonian rock. Ted and I are so excited. So we take off, uh, we had the fortune cookie in 1998. Um, and so it took us about a year and a half to get the money and the permits to work in this fabulous place. And we started on the western part of the Arctic. And you could see this is what camp looked like in 1999. See, each of us have our own personal tent, those little, the small ones. It's good, it keeps us working together because we have our own personal tent. And you could build a, a wind wall around them. And if you build a wind wall around those tents, they can withstand winds up to 60 miles an hour. It's really great. That, see that kitchen tent there, that Kansas kitchen tent? That can withstand winds about 35 miles an hour. So I spent, I spent about half my uh, scientific career chasing that kitchen tent around the Canadian <laughs> Arctic as it, as it gets blown around. But anyway, so it um, gives you a sense of what it looked like in the western part of the Arctic. Essentially what you're seeing are the Devonian rocks. And the whole research really was, you'd wake up in the morning with the geological maps, and out we go, walking those rocks in different sectors, looking for bones that may be weathering out from the surface. That's what it was about. And we found some bones. We found evidence of deep water sharks, uh, deep water fish from a variety of different, um, of different groups, but it became very clear we were in the wrong environment. Um, and what happened was we were in deep ocean rocks, black shales. So we were in the middle of the sea, going back to the cartoon I showed you before. What we needed to do geologically was move upstream. We needed to move to the estuaries and the rivers because this is where we thought those creatures would be. So what that meant, following the geology, following the trail, is going east. Okay, so the next year, we wanted to get into river and stream rocks. We went east to southern Ellesmere Island. This is what camp looked like that year. You can see it's a little more montane, so you can, actually can run up and down those things. Not easily, but you can run up and down them. That's all Devonian rock that you see in those cliffs there. Um, and those are formed in ancient rivers and streams. And since from there, we started to find fossil fish that were low fin fish, but not the ones we're looking for. In fact, we started finding bits and pieces of them. What we needed were really fine-grained rocks. So we spent another two years, two summers, identifying rocks in this valley here. And it was in this valley where a college student, Jason Downs, was working with us and discovered a fossil site. And that fossil site was here where we dug a big hole. My pointer's not working, but there's, um, you can see where that big notch is right, right here. Um, that is a site that was literally covered with thousands of fish bones, fragments. And we dug into it and found the layer that those fragments were coming from, and they were produced by skeleton after skeleton of fossil fish piled one on top of the other. It was mind-blowing. And we worked that for another year. We're cutting through a lot of years here. Um, we were finding lots of fish, but nothing I'd be here talking to you about. Then everything changed one day in that site, just that hole there, when my colleague Steve, Steve Gatesy um, from Brown, Pulled a rock from this spot right here. I don't have a pointer, so I'm going to do this right here. Um, he saw this V. That's bone. This is rock. That's bone, clear bone, fish bone. And he said, hey, guys, what's this? So I ran over to that. And as soon as I saw that, I knew we had found what we were looking for. Because what I saw, and I'll, this will make sense to you in a second, were teeth right here, that this is a jaw, that this is an upside down skull. And it's not a skull of just anything. It's a fish. And not just any fish, it's a skull of a flat-headed fish. Remember I told you conical to flat? Here I had a flat-headed fish looking right out at me. It's exactly what, central casting, what we were looking for. Because with any luck, you know, the rocks, it would be going into the cliff, and it turned out to be doing so. And then Steve had roughed it out. As we removed this one, we found four more of these. Okay, we now have 20. They range in size from four feet to nine feet. So anyway, these kind of things get wrapped in plaster or urethane for the trip home to Chicago and Philadelphia. That's a first-year graduate student as a scale bar because uh, they, <laughs> they, the, uh, they come underneath the helicopter. Now the fun began. Bring these things home, open up the plaster. The preparators remove the rock grain by grain with the tool. And over three months, here's what Steve's specimen looked like. Looked like. 
Look, it looks like it has a flat head with eyes on top. You sort of see those eye holes, so-called orbits. Another six months go by, look at this, a flat head with eyes on top. It even looks like there's a little neck back there, there's a shoulder behind it. What were we doing? We were using the tools of geology and evolutionary biology to predict the right kind of place to find a flat-headed fish with fins. It took us eight years, but we found a flat-headed fish with fins. This creature, like a fish, has scales in its back, which you can see uh, here. Um, the, uh, it has fins, these are the fins here. You can see the fin rays. But like an early limbed animal, it has um, a flat head with eyes on top. It has other things in the skull as well. Um, it has a neck, just like early limbed animals. And when you open up the fin, it has bones that correspond to radius, ulna, even parts. It has bones that correspond to shoulder, elbow, even parts of, even parts of a wrist. Really kind of amazing. So I brought, this is it. This is a cast of the skull. You're more than happy to, uh, to play with it afterwards. Don't worry, my, my kids when they're in preschool would play with this all the time. You're not going to break it. It's epoxy. Um, to give you a sense, just to key you in on how you train your eye. You know that V that Steve was talking about? See that V right here? That's that V right here, like that. So this is the first thing we saw. So we saw the V, there's the teeth, and I saw it was flat-headed. So there's method to our madness. Um, so that was fun. Um, then it got even more fun, because we get to do the science on it. Um, but it began with uh, thinking of a scientific name. Um, and so we engaged the Inuit elders in this enterprise, the Inuit community of elders. Um, and we wanted to have a naming project with them, and there were two goals to this naming project. We wanted a name that's meaningful to them and to us. That proved to be challenging. And the second, which proved to be even more challenging, is we wanted a name we could pronounce. And uh, <laughs> the name of the committee didn't lend me a whole lot of confidence that we'd have a, have a name we could pronounce. And so, uh, I was talking to the gentleman in the middle. I was in Chicago. He was in Grease Fjord, that town I showed you before. And it was frustrating because they had no concept for fossils. I said, I said, we found a fish. He said, where'd you find it? I said, we found it in rocks. Long pause. You know, hunters don't find fish in rocks. Oh, right, no concept for fossil. So we, we worked a while on that. Eventually, he got it. Then he's like, okay, how much is this worth? Because then he thought I was ripping them off because, you know, maybe these things are worth a lot of money. I said, no, 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 I'm a scientist. That don't make any money. Then he thought I was crazy, okay? So we had all this <laughs> stuff going on. Eventually got all angry at me. He said, look, just tell me what it is and where it lives. Oh, I said, it's a large freshwater fish. He said, why don't you say so? You got yourself a tiktaalik. I said, a tiktaalik, what's that? It's a large freshwater fish in their language. <laughs> and so that's, it sort of stuck. It's kind of like the fortune cookie. Anyway, so we had multiple specimens of these things. And, and the technology has changed since we began to work on them. Um, we had, this is one of the big specimens. This is one that's an upside down head. So it's a big specimen, like twice the size of this. You're looking at two jaws um, coming together. And we were able to take it apart and see, take each thin bone out. So we were able to, say, pull out this bone, which is a humerus, corresponds to our upper arm bone. You know how we have one bone, two bones, little bones, fingers? We were able to pull each of these one bone, two bones, little bones out of Tiktaalik. And we were able to reconstruct the skeleton. And you could see how it's a, it's a blend between fish and limbed animal. There are other creatures like it known um, from Eastern, Eastern Europe and, and Quebec. But these creatures have a neck, they have arm bones set in a fin, um, they have beautiful ribs, it's a real mix between fish and tetrapod. As I said, the, the technology's changed, we can now scan these things. So you could see here the humerus on top, you could see the radius and ulna, you could see in blue the fin rays, we can model where the um, vasculature was. We can begin to see, as shown on the left here, you could see the joints of each part of this fin. On top in A is the shoulder of this animal, it has a socket in the shoulder, and here's the ball on the humerus, on the upper arm bone. In B, this is the elbow of this fish, where the radius and ulna would have fit in. And you can see the shapes very carefully defined. And then you have what's called the proximal and distal carpus, two portions of the wrist, which correspond to wrist bones in basal uh, amphibians. What you have is the ability to really think about the posture of these things, too, because we can match the bones together and really think about you know, how they all fit together and function. We can now put the head in a CT scanner, a special kind. You wouldn't want to go in there. It would kind of burn you pretty badly, but these are high-energy CT scanners. We can begin to see the dentition. We can take it apart. These are huge teeth. This was a massive predator. So what's Tiktaalik? Tiktaalik is a creature with lungs and gills, with, um, with fins that have arm bones inside, with a head that has aspects of both fish uh, and limbed animals. It's truly remarkable, and I can talk about the origin of tetrapods, origin of limbed animals, all day.
But we're here to find out about our inner fish and how that's written in fossils and DNA. This is a starting point. And here's the take-home message. When we talk about the wrist that we see in Tiktaalik and its evolutionary cousins in the Devonian for the first time, when we talk about the neck that we see for the first time in Tiktaalik and its cousins for the first time, we're not just talking about some esoteric event in the history of life. We're talking about something that's in our own bodies. The transition from fish to limbed animal is not some random branch. It's a part of us. So every time you bend your wrist, every time you shake your head, you could thank these creatures living in ancient Devonian seas. How do we know that? We can map these things on an evolutionary tree and begin to see how the different creatures fit together in an evolutionary sense. And once we do that, we can begin, we can begin to trace the bones. We could trace the humerus, the upper arm bone, from creatures like basal fish to tiktaalik to things we call amphibians and reptiles and other mammals and humans. We can trace the radius and ulna. We could trace these bones all the way from fish to us. So our inner fish is seen in these bones and how they fit together, and we can begin to see uh, how they came about. This changes the way you see biology. It changes the way you see the world. Okay? We biologists use our, these connections as tools in biomedical research. But also, as a paleontologist, it changes the way I see things. I mean, you are no doubt looking at this in creature and thinking, wow, that's a pinnacle of human, ach human achievement. I look at this creature, I'll agree with you, yes, a pinnacle of human achievement, but I see something else. I see a big, fat, old fish. And <laughs> it's helpful to compare Professor Einstein to the fish. Uh, I labeled it here for you. Einstein's on the left, by the way. Um, <laughs> Uh, I told you it changes how you look at the world. We can do it from the fossils. We can do, comp do it, compare this from the embryos. We can compare it from the DNA. And when we do our jobs right, those stories, those hypotheses tie together. Let me give you an example. If you look at a human embryo uh, in, in the head area, what becomes the head area a few weeks after conception, what you see is this on top. That's Einstein. That's you. That's me. You have paired primordia for the eyes on top. And then you see I've color-coded these swellings. There are four of them. I've, and I've colored them from light blue to dark blue to green to yellow. And you could see they're paired. You could see that there's a little cleft between them. Indeed, there are cells in there. Some cells are kind of migrating to be in there. Others are dividing in place. If you look at a head of, say, a shark or a fish, you see a, uh, embryos aren't identical. But what you see are similar things. You see paired primordia for the eyes. And you see these swellings as well, which I've color-coded. You can map these cells and see what happens to them. Do it. So if we map the cells in a shark embryo, the first one in light blue becomes portions of the upper and lower jaws. The other ones become portions of the gill apparatus. The skeleton, the muscles, the nerves, and the arteries, all that stuff are derived from this, this pattern you see in these swellings. What happens in people <coughs> and other mammals? The first one in light blue becomes a portion of the lower jaw and two bones in the middle ear. The second one, shown in sort of the darker blue, becomes a little throat bone called the hyoid, um, a little bone at the base of the skull, and one bone in the middle ear. And the other two becomes portions of the voice box, as well as the muscles and nerves and bones that control all this stuff. What's the take-home message? The take-home message is many of the muscles and nerves and bones that I'm using to talk to you with right now, and many of the muscles and nerves and bones you're using to hear me with right now correspond to gill structures uh, in fish and sharks. And how do we know that? We know that because we can compare the development and see commonalities in the development. We know that because we can compare the fossils. That is, we can see the transformation of this particular bone, this light blue bone, dark blue bone here in sharks. We can see it in its transformation from sharks and fish to become the stapes in the ear of humans. We could begin to see how these two bones are originally in reptiles derived from lower jaws. When we start to look at the fossil record, we start to see surprising uh, connections. But that is not the only piece. We can look at the embryos. We can look at the DNA that drives the processes of development. Indeed, the meeting that we're here for the next two days is really looking at some of the most fundamental problems in biology. They all begin here with a fertilized egg. This is one of the most remarkable things in biology. And it's one of the most remarkable things in biology that speaks to evolution. Because what you have in the fertilized egg 
is all kinds of information. Information in the DNA and proteins and other molecules inside that egg. And that information, when deployed over time, contains a recipe, a dynamic recipe and a toolkit that will build a body. What starts as a single cell ends up as an individual over development with trillions of cells. Trillions of cells that look different and do different things. Trillions of cells that are packaged in particular ways. We call going from this single cell to a creature with, say, three trillion of their own cells, we call that bodybuilding, going from the creature on the left <laughs> to the creature on the right. A lot of things involved here, right? There's the DNA recipe, there's the DNA toolkit in the egg that, that, that instructs cells to divide and die and, and, and do their various cellular behaviors, which build tissues and organs. There's also an interaction with the environment, and in this case, probably a lot of hard work and steroids. <laughs> and, but one of, the, one of the most stunning facts over the la uh, that discovered over the last 35 years is the de degree to which subtle changes in the way genes are controlled, the way they're turned on and off in development, and the interactions among the switches that control their activity, the way understanding that can help us understand fundamental uh, problems uh, of evolution. And I want to give an example. This is unpublished from my lab's work, just to give you an example. Again, let's, we're, let's go back to the same problem. Let's look at the Tiktaalik question, but now let's use living animals to do it and ask about this toolkit. Here's a fin on the right of a zebrafish. This is a standard fish lab animal that lots of scientists work on because it's easy to manipulate and see in the laboratory. They develop really fast, get lots of embryos, really wonderful little model system. There's the fin, okay? Does that look like the tetrapod limb on the left? Not so much. Because look at this, you have in black here on both, these are bones that form in a cartilage model. In light, these are bones that are dermal, that they're not formed in a cartilage model. And in fact, if you compare it, a fish fin has kind of bones that are, have a very different origin from, from to limbs. So is there an equivalent of a wrist in living critters? Sure doesn't look like it anatomically, but can we begin to use this new molecular toolkit to come up with some ideas and some experiments? Well, let me give you a, one set of genes that are interesting here. There's one set of genes called the, called the Hox genes, which are involved in lots of patterning, a lot of structures. They're very involved in limbs. And in particular, the ones called, known as the Hox 13 genes, and there are a couple of different flavors of them. Those flavors act together to really define the wrist and digits. So what you're seeing here is a mouse. On the left is an embryo, okay, thin, it's a thin bud. On the right is the, uh, sort of the adult mouse. And what you're seeing here in dark is where the Hox13 genes are active, where they're, where they're being expressed. Well, it turns out you can map the cells that contain Hox genes, the, these, these particular Hox genes, and follow them to development, follow them through to the adult stages, and they map the wrist and fingers perfectly. Okay? And when you engineer a mouse without these genes, guess what? It's a mouse that, as an adult, doesn't have a wrist or digits. So these things are necessary for the wrist and digits, the wrist and fingers, to form these genes. Okay, you don't have them. You don't. You, have, you knock them out in the mouse. You don't and you end up with a mouse with none of them. And in a cellular level, they they mark them. Uh, they mark that compartment beautifully. And this has been known for for a period of time. It's an open question. Where does this lie in fish? So we did this. So if you look at these Hox cells, that's in a mouse. If you engineer a fish that has a particular sort of um, genetic background where you can map these cells and see where they end up in the, in the limb, just like the mouse, guess what happens? Boom. What you find is the equivalent of the wrist and digits in a fish fin is this terminal end of the fin here, as well as all the fin rays. Wow. Now we can use molecules to see what's similar and different in different critters. And when we knock them out, this is just a recent result that took about like two years to do in my lab. This is the normal fin, the so-called wild type. You see it's really big, has beautiful fin rays. When you knock out these same Hox genes, you end up with a fin that loses the fin rays. So what I'm telling you is we can use this new molecular toolkit to ask paleontological questions. And we can do it in an experimental way that, that tells us about mechanisms. That is, if we take the molecular record at its face value, you can compare the wrist and digits to the, to the terminal end of fish fins. So what I'm telling you is that the inner fish that we see is not just written in fossils and bones, it's written in our DNA. And we can begin to trace that using uh, many tools. 
Now, you can ask the question, like, okay, who cares? Who cares about inner fish? Well, it turns out biomedical science really cares about your inner fly, your inner fish, your inner mouse. That is, if you look at Nobel Prizes awarded for basic biomedical breakthroughs, who have they gone to? They've gone to people working on flies. They've gone to people working on corn. In fact, two Nobel Prizes awarded to five people in the last nine years have gone to folks working on a tiny little worm the size of a comma on a piece of paper. Yet that little worm is telling us about how our genes are turned off uh, and die naturally and in disease and how we can manipulate the genome in many ways. So it's really a fundamental little worm for under unlocking many of the secrets of our own biology. I like to think that as we discover cures to everything that ails us, from Alzheimer's to different cancers, that the breakthroughs that will extend and enrich our lives will ultimately in some way be based on worms, flies, mice, and in some cases even fish. I can't imagine a more powerful or more beautiful statement on the importance of our connection to the rest of life on our planet than that. Thank you very much.